Good morning and welcome to Old West Church worship. We want to say that whomever you are, whatever you're struggling with, whomever you love, you're welcome here and we're grateful to be worshiping with you. Pastor Sarah's on vacation and our colleague Steve Dry will be bringing the sermon this morning. There's no fiber arts, um, but it'll be back on August 24th. And we're hoping people can mark the date September 18th, which is a food forest training day. It's a Saturday from nine to 12. Now, as we prepare for worship, I invite you to join us here in the sanctuary and in your own homes with our call to worship. God of creation, you formed our inmost being. You knit us together in our mother's wombs. God of emergence, we praise you. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And now uh, we have the pleasure of having the organ played for the first time since we left uh, the church and we're going to sing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. The first two verses. in our responsive reading. So I will be reading the italics and feel free to follow along in the bold. You who are the Lord's holy ones, honor him because those who honor him don't lack a thing. Even strong young lions go without and get hungry about those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come children, listen to me. Let me teach you how to honor the Lord. Do you love life? Do you relish the chance to enjoy good things? Then you must keep your tongue from evil and keep your lips from speaking lies. Turn away from evil, do good, seek peace and go after it. We have two scripture readings. Uh, I do. We have two scripture readings. The first one is from 1 John, and you certainly can see what the theme is. Dear friends, let us love each other because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us this way, we also ought to love each other. 
No one has ever seen God. If we love each other, God remains in us and his love is made perfect in us. This is how we know we remain in him and he remains in us because he has given us a measure of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. If any of us confess that Jesus is God's son, God remains in us and we remain in God. We have known and have believed the love that God has for us. God is love and those who remain in love remain in God and God remains in them. This is how love has been perfected in us so that we can have confidence on the judgment day because we are exactly the same as God is in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. After all, those who don't love their brothers or sisters whom they have seen can hardly love God whom they have not seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. And the second reading is from Matthew 22. One of them, a legal expert, tested him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. and 40 form at Harvard Epworth United Methodist Church. And we're working uh, with folks to help them sift through their inner lives and listen for their calling and act out um, lives of purpose and meaning. Uh, today, I wanted to chat with you about this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, and if I'm honest, uh, this is a topic that I probably would zone out for if I was on your end, um, not because I wasn't interested, but because um, I, I feel like most sermons like this are, are generally the same and the, the message is clear and, um, and it's frustrating because the message is so clear. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Um, and why do we live in such a world that where injustice prevails in so many cases and judgment is um, all over the place, and yet these are the primary tenets of most major religions. So um, I've had some time to think about the text, and I, I have, it has changed the way that I've, I've um, approached it, and so I hope you'll stick with me for a little bit um, and hear a little bit about that kind of experience and, and kind of some, an alternative way to think about the text today. Um, so a few months ago, I was at a meeting and afterwards a colleague um, and I were talking and, and he asked simply kind of what did you think about the performance of the other folks in the room? And I immediately said that I felt like they lacked preparedness and I went into some detail about how I felt like they didn't seem to know what they were maybe speaking about and didn't they weren't eloquent in their speech and um, and so I went into detail and a few minutes later, he turned attention to me and asked me how I felt like I did. And really without thinking, I said, I wish I had been more prepared. And he sort of like grinned and I realized what I had said. And I realized how I had been judging them for something and also judging myself for the same thing. And 
we got into some conversation about where I felt like that stemmed from. Um, and I started to realize that I had this pattern um, of really connecting my self-worth with my performance, right? Whether that was doing really well in school or doing really, you know, running really fast in track or getting all my the merit badges and excelling in Boy Scouts. And in each of these cases, my self-worth was primarily connected to my um, performance, right? My, my work, whatever I was doing at the time. And as we started to kind of think deeper, I realized that this is true of me generally, that like I even make, it makes me uncomfortable for someone to say that they love me and not be directly connected to some sort of activity that I had done for them, right? And I realized, I was like, interesting. Um, so there's this connection between my judgment of others and my judgment of self. And then I started thinking about this text, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. And maybe it's not that we are so bad at it. Maybe we're actually pretty good at it. We're pretty good at loving our neighbors as ourselves. We're just really bad at loving ourselves. Um, and, and maybe for you, it's not, um, it's not like judging others based you know, on their performance, right? Maybe for you, it's something different. Maybe you're overly judgmental of someone because of like their indecision, right? man, can't they just make a decision already? Or, or maybe it's about their body image. You know, they've really let themselves go. Or um, perhaps it's about their leadership. You know, I, I wouldn't have done that, right? That's, that was silly. You know, her, him? Um, and I, I think it's really interesting that in those moments of judgment, um, they, they're kind of externalized, but they're often not really reality right and there's there's a lot of how we interpret others ends up being directly connected to our own insecurities and our own kind of lack of of self-love right so for that person in who's you know you you find irritating because of their indecision sometimes that might be because you yourself are irritated at your own indecisiveness right or or maybe that your critical um, kind of perspective on someone's body is reflective of, of something deeper that you have with yourself around your own body image, right? Or your own leadership skills. And, and what I realized is there is that this interesting connection between those two things. Um, and it really offers an, int an opportunity for us, um, this judgment to be, um, to be, uh, an invitation to um, greater self-love and self-work there, right? And I think that's what happens in this text today, right? So the, the perfect love text, right? We're, we're invited into a, a posture of self-reflection and then self-love, right? So there's kind of three things that I want to touch on today in terms of this passage. The first is <clears throat> this idea of perfect love, right? So we know that God's love is perfect love. Um, and there's two ways we can think about perfection, right? And perfect love. Think about perfection as like the kind of Olympics, you know, gymnastics, perfect 10, flawless, without, deep, without fault, perfect, right? In which case we have to do things, per, you know, the right way. But there's a second one that I think is more useful to this conversation, which is perfection as being complete or whole, right? That, uh, that, that we are, perfect love means that we're loved for every part of ourselves as opposed to just the parts, right? And we know that this is a better reflection of God's love, but God's perfect love, because of Psalm 139, right? Where God knows our innermost Selves. God has searched us out and knows everything about us, right? You know, we are, we are not used car salespeople, right? We are people who are known for all of ourselves and are the love that God shares, that unconditional love that God gave God's only son for, that love is a complete love. It's a whole love, right? Uh, and so we know that perfect love is, is definitely an all-encompassing and whole love. 
Second thing we know is that that perfect love casts out fear, right? So for me, the equation is basically, if you're perfectly loving, then the fear isn't, can't be part of that, right? If, and and I, I even take it as far as to say, you know, if you find yourself judging someone else, you can be pretty sure that you're not perfectly loving, right? That you're, that there is something there that is, and, and it's not just that you're not perfectly loving them, right? There's also this direction inward, this invitation to say, well, I'm also perfect, not perfectly loving myself, right? And so I think that's secondly very important. Perfect love casts out fear. And I think the last thing that we want to, you know, touch base on is this idea that um, that perfect love also helps us to um, perfect our love for ourselves, right? That in learning to and teaching uh, teaching ourselves to love others for in, in their imperfections, right, and their flaws and everything, to to learn that whole love is also a practice of learning to love ourselves, right? God lives in us, and when we love one another, God lives in us, and love is perfected in us, right? This idea that we can practice perfect love on others, which helps us to come to love ourselves better as well. And then I want to introduce a practice that I think connects well with this um, idea, and one that I've been trying to um, employ in my own life. Um, it's a four A. It's four A's. Okay, right? Because I'm still in recovery from my student success days, right? Where A's were the only important thing, right? So all A's. <laughs> so first A, acknowledge. So when you when you find yourself judging, uh, start by just acknowledging that you're doing it. For me, that was working with the, it was it was with my colleague, right? And. And he was able to say, hey, Steve, you just said this about the other people, and then you said it about yourself, and like made that connection known, which was something that blew my mind, right? And hadn't been known to me before. Um, and so acknowledging that connection is the first step, right? Uh, and you can do that with that, you know, maybe it's a, a transparent colleague, maybe it's your pastor, maybe it's a therapist. Um, we do a lot of journaling of 40 form, and I find that it's really helpful to be able to go back to journals and identify ways in which I've said the same thing in many different instances. And so whatever it is for you, acknowledging that judgment occurs. Then the second thing I want you to do is affirm. So switch the narrative. Say, instead of judging that person for, for something, how is it a benefit? How have they, how is this a, a gift that they offer to the world? Um, I have been told by colleagues that I am overly professional. Even friends have told me this, right? And so, um, of course, you know, hearing this, I, and, and as a result, that makes me less approachable, right? Um, and so when I think about affirming those colleagues who were not prepared, lack of preparation can feel raw. It can feel authentic. It can feel vulnerable. It comes out of a place that isn't prepared. And so it feels more real. Uh, and so to affirm that is to, you know, is to say, look, they're bringing their full selves, their, their lower, you know, ability, their ability to build trust with others might be higher because of that. So you affirm this gift. Then I say, analyze internally. Where is that judgment coming from? And what, can, what do I learn about myself and my self-love as a result of that? For me, it was to say, okay, I get, I am... I understand myself and the way that I approach, you know, feel love related to my success. And so um, it was helpful to be able to say, okay, that is who I am, right? I connect this, my success with my sense of self and my sense of being, my ability to be loved, right? And, and then the last thing, so analyze your, yourself and based on the, where you see um, kind of that judgment coming from in you and how you are how you're also directing that judgment towards yourself And then finally is act act in some sort of way to um, To kind of stop that cycle and behave, you know behavior of, of self judgment, right? So for me when I when I find myself Being triggered because I'm getting critical feedback on a piece of 
work that I did, right? I just remind myself always, okay, I am not, I am not my work, right? That's my mantra. I am not my work. If I get, if I start getting anxious because I'm, you know, getting feedback and maybe it's not positive feedback, remember that I am not my work and I can, um, I'm loved and I'm lovable even in, amidst these uh, more critical feedback sessions, right? So I'd invite you to acknowledge, affirm, analyze, and act um, to really help to, to find that perfect love for yourself, right? Help you to use self-judgment as a, te- I, I call it kind of a technology of the soul or technology of calling, right? It's like this really amazing thing that our bodies and our minds do and our souls do to tell us, hey, you know, I'm being judgmental here. And if I can use that as a as tool to identify this place in me that I need to work on, that's amazing, right? And, and ultimately, we're all so gifted. And, and, you know, if we can learn to love ourselves, and if we can learn to treat ourselves kindly and lovingly and, and wholly, um, then that's the power that, you know, that, that God has made possible in, in each of us, right? You're different and amazing and put on this, on this earth to do amazing things as part of this great kingdom, right? So I invite you to do that hard work because it's the kind of work that's going to help you and others to flourish here, right? For me, it's, it's been, it's meant being able to say no to things because I I kept trying to say yes, because I, you know, I felt only lovable if I was doing things, right? So my, I've personally felt transformed and been able to uh, be more resilient, I think, as a result and, and and, uh, avoid kind of the burnout cycles that I kept finding myself in. And, And I wish for you the same, that, that you might find in, in, in your perfect love of yourself and of others, um, that you might find ways to just be, embrace yourself and embrace others and those gifts that they bring um, that we might all together work, work towards the kingdom. Uh, in the name of the one who made us gifted uh, and, and for a purpose, I offer these words. Amen. I realized I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. Uh, I'm Elsa Bengal, a member of Old West Church. And so now it's uh, time for open space. And um, I invite you to think about what Steve just said, the four A's as a methodology to increase our love uh, for ourselves and for others. Open space is a time of reflection and response. So during this time, you're invited to put your prayer requests um, and using the digital prayer request form. And if you're online, you'll find the link in the chat box. If you're in person, scan the QR code and it will direct you to the right spot. And we'll read these out loud um, in a bit. And we also invite you to give online by using oldwestchurch.org backslash donate or scan the QR code or put your offering in the plate on the table. While we respond and reflect, we'll listen to some music. And when the song is over, we'll enter into a time of communal prayer. Welcome to Open Space.
um, join together in this hymn, Faith is Patience in the Night. Listen to the introduction uh, to hear the, uh, the tune. Now, Kate and I will read the mass shootings that have happened um, in the past week. And it's interesting, when we first pulled up this uh, website, there were 18 pages of mass shootings. And we were like, wow, we can't do that. We can't read 18 pages. Well, that's if you included the single shootings. In one week, 18 pages. We're only lifting up the mass shootings um, this week. Um, and uh, so let us uh, pray over these. Akron, Ohio, five injured. Indianapolis, Indiana, four injured, one killed. Brooklyn, New York, four injured. Trenton, New Jersey, four injured. Las Vegas, Nevada, six injured and one killed. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, four injured, one killed. Portland, Oregon, four injured and two killed. Clarksdale, Mississippi, two injured, two killed. Flint, Michigan, four injured, two killed. Boston, Massachusetts, five injured, one killed. Brooklyn, New York, three injured and two killed. Chicago, Illinois, four injured, one killed. New Orleans, Louisiana, five injured, Houston, Texas, five injured, one killed. Washington, D.C., four injured. Chicago, Illinois, five injured, one killed. God, God hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. So now we're going to read your prayer requests as soon as we can bring them up here. Uh, That's perfect. Yep. One of them was your response. Yeah. For Afghanistan. God, God hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. I pray for courage and action responding to the UN's latest report. Our world is burning. God, God hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And also for the people of Haiti. God, God hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. So it's a short list this week. But we know there's many things that we would lift up in our prayer. So at home here at Old West, let us pray together. Oh, mercy, 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 God. 
whether we look to Haiti or look to Afghanistan or look to the floods in China or the fires in Siberia and the fires in our Northwest, it seems that everywhere we look, there's tragedy, there's destruction, things are out of control. This is the reality that we live with. This is the world, the good world that you have given us. And so we pray with burdened hearts this morning. We pray for ways to deal with this level of suffering and disaster. We pray for fearlessness. As Steve said in his sermon, when we're afraid, we are not living in your spirit. And so we pray that we could move beyond fear and stay rooted in love and ask what love is calling us to do. We give thanks this morning for each person who is gathered in this worship service uh, from uh, three years old to probably I'm the oldest, 76 years old. We give thanks for our diverse community, our multi-age community. We give thanks, especially this morning for Kate and Patricia, our technicians who are making all of this happen and um, for their skill and commitment to making sure that this worship service is broadcast. We give thanks that John, um, Rosalie's husband, John, is coming home from the hospital tomorrow. He's been there for a couple of months. So this is great news. We give thanks for the work of our hands, the work of our hearts. And we pray that we hold all that close and give thanks for our abilities, give thanks for our ways of engaging in your world, our world, this world. And as we look ahead to the week, we pray that when fear rises up, we find a little crack and let love back in. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I now invite you to join in this prayer. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, divine parent of us all, loving God and whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is, What Wondrous Love Is This? I think this, is this a Charles Wesley hymn? Yeah. I think it is, yes. Yeah. So this, this hymn was written a few hundred years ago. Um, and uh, it's a question, what is this wondrous love?
that's one worthy of a conversation. Our benediction now will be led by Maya. And uh, um, go forth in hope, go forth in peace. We, we go, go forth, forth with, with the knowledge of God's presence with us. So to serve God by taking care of each other and God's world. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.